strange man. I said to him, look, you can't build a rocket to fly to the sun. It'll melt. Oh no, sir, he said. We sorted that one out. He said, we're going at night. <laughs> I've just come back from America, you know. And um, the Clinton thing's still going. Well, you've heard about all that stuff, I'm sure you have, about, uh, about Monica. And it's interesting, you know, in America, you know when they're asking people to sign something? They say, put your John Hancock on this, you know. Guy that signed one of the declarations. And I told him, I said, in England, like, when we want someone to sign something, we say, put your moniker on this, you know. That's, I said, it's taken a whole new meaning in the last year, that thing. But it, the, the church are involved in the Clinton thing now, you know. The bloody church get everywhere. You know, the Vatican have brought out a new commandment. The Clinton commandment. Have you, have you heard that one? I saw it on CNN. You know CNN, claptrap, no news, it must be true. Yeah, it's called the Clinton commandment and it reads, Thou shalt not comfort thy rod with thy staff. <laughs> It's funny, Bill. You know when you see, you see people like Bill Clinton and George Bush and all these people? And you ask the question, how do these geezers become presidents of the United States? I mean, how do they bloody get there, you know? An old tone comes into that category from my point of view as well, I must say. But tonight, we're going to see how they get there. And how actually, the same people have been controlling the world for a very very long time, staggeringly long time. And I started on a journey um, 10 years ago in England. You may have noticed when I started it, you know, got a bit of publicity like, didn't it, really? Um, and I've just followed this trickle of information that I had at the time. And as the years have passed, it's become a river, a flood, and now it's a tidal wave. And with every step I have taken along that journey, the picture has got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It is not just about a few guys that want to stitch up the political and the financial world. It's a colossal picture. And in the, what, four or five hours I've got tonight, I'll be scratching the surface because now there's so much to know. And information is what I'm about really. If you come into this area of research with any preconceived idea and any belief system to defend, then you might as well go and watch The Price is Right or something. Wheel of bloody fortune. Because your belief system will start to edit the information. Oh, I'm not going there. Oh my goodness me. And because of what happened to me in Britain in the early 1990s when I was ridiculed just a little bit, I let go of the prison that most people live in. The fear of what other people think. And only by letting go of that and walking out of that prison that most people live in could I now be talking about some of the things that I am and will talk about tonight. So if we're going to go along this journey of uncovering what's really going on in the world, we need A, not to care what other people think about what we say, and we also need to follow information without an editing belief system. And information can be um, a very useful thing, you know. Very useful thing. It'll get you out a lot of, a lot of trouble. I came across this card, see, sums it up really. There's this monkey here, see, hanging from this branch with one end. And there's this other monkey who's just hit the ground at a very big rate of knots, clunk. And this monkey's saying, I told you a hundred times, don't scratch your ass with both hands. Now, information, if we open ourselves to it, can get us out of a lot of trouble. And if we don't have that information, it can put us in a tiny, tiny prison of reality and sense of possibility. 
And if you are a network of a few people who seek to manipulate and direct the lives of billions, absolutely essential to that is to suppress information that would let the people see A, what's really going on, and B, even more important, the true magnitude of who we are. You have to persuade infinite beings, multidimensional infinity, which we call humans, to believe that they are ordinary men and women in the street with no friggin' power. Then you got them. And to do that, you have to spend centuries and centuries suppressing the knowledge and the information that would allow people to see the true genius that we all are. Instead of being infinite beings, the idea is to put us in these eggshells, as I call them. Eggshells overwhelmingly made up of the four-letter word that controls the world, fear. So we shut out all that infinite level of ourselves, levels of ourselves, all that knowledge, inspiration, wisdom, understanding, instinctive knowing, and we operate in a fraction of who we are. Only then can the few control the mass. And if people think, and I understand it, that a few people couldn't control this planet because there's too many people to control, well, they just have to look at what happens to herds of sheep every day all over the world. If those sheep expressed their uniqueness and didn't succumb to fear, they thought for themselves it would be impossible to control those sheep. You can't do it physically. I mean, look at them bloody pigs. You remember them pigs in England a couple of years ago? They went, they went walkabout from the slaughterhouse, and I don't blame them. It took the might of the great British Empire. What was it? Five, six, seven days to catch these bloody pigs? They're on, they're on the bloody news, these pigs. Because they couldn't catch him. Because if you want to control large numbers of people physically with a few, then forget it. But you don't have to. It's not how it's done. It's not necessary. To control a herd of sheep physically, you'd need six or seven blokes for every sheep and they wouldn't even be then guaranteed to catch it. But how is it done then? It's done through the two states of being that not only control herds of sheep, they control humanity, second by second, day after day. The two states of being of what I call bar bar and fear. What happens, I mean, everyone must have seen this from time to time. The farmer arrives at a certain time in the day, one or two of the friggin' sheep start to walk, and then they're all at it, aren't they? Following the one in front, bar 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 bar. And no one says, excuse me, you're at the front? Where you going? And if we did, they'd probably turn around and go, I don't know, really? But we still follow, bah, 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 bah. That accounts for most of them. And then you've got the tiny few who go on munching. They don't want to follow the one in front, I want to go there. And they're sorted by the other element in this duo. Fear, symbolised by the sheepdog. She go right, 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 and they're in line, aren't they? And those two states of being of barbar and fear round up millions and millions of sheep on this planet every single day, without anyone doing anything physically, apart from a few barks here and there. And it's kind of funny to watch. Oh, look at them sheep, Ethel, Ethel, come look at these sheep. I'm so stupid. And then we apply that to the human expression. And we find that we have actually out sheep the sheep. We have dispensed with the sheepdog. We police each other. And what that means is that he who sets the norms in society 
What is considered right and wrong, moral and immoral, possible or impossible, sane or insane, sets a mental and emotional human sheep pen, which the vast majority of people will live in because they're not thinking for themselves, but a bar. Well, our Dave, he's a professor. He goes to university, he must know what he's doing. I will not question him, he's very clever. And that leaves a few who look at these mental and emotional prisons, these norms in society, and they can see that they're limited, that they are flawed, and at their extreme, they are manipulating in pursuit of control. But what do the vast majority of those who've sussed it do? Because of the other element, fear, fear of what other people think, fear of being different, fear of having a different truth to the norm, most of them also live their lives within those norms, within that sheep pen, even though they've sussed that it's a fraction of possibility. And when you get to the edge of these mental and emotional prisons, these hassle-free zones as I call it, comfort zones some people call them, and you know that if you go any further in speaking your truth and living a different lifestyle, you know if you go any further you're going to meet condemnation and ridicule for the crime, and that's what it's become, of being different. What is the, what is the source of that fear? Shall I, shan't I? It's not fear of what people in apparent positions of power will do. It's not fear of what Tony Blair will do if you express your uniqueness. Not that I could give a shit, I couldn't tell you. It's, it's not fear of what Bill Clinton will think or the head of the Bank of England. What's going through the minds of people who are saying, shall I, shan't I be me or shall I be someone else's version of what I should be? It's, if I do, what will my mother say? Oh my God. What, what, what will the people at work say? Oh my God. What about... What about the people down the bar? In other words, the people who frighten others into conforming are those who are already conforming. Because if people want to give their minds away and give their lives away to someone else's version of reality instead of their own, that's fine, I have a problem with that. Be my guest, have a cup of tea. That's not the point that we pass that gives the few the ability to control the planet. It makes it easier, yeah, but it doesn't cross the line where it becomes possible. That line is crossed when those who concede their mind to someone else's norms then insist that everyone else does the same. Because that's when the human race becomes not only the sheep but the sheepdog. That's the point when we police each other. And if you are a handful, literally a handful compared with the population of planet Earth who are manipulating, what is it now supposed to be six billion? Has anyone counted them? How do they work that out? Six billion, apparently. It is absolutely essential that you get the six billion to keep each other in line. Because there's not enough of you to do it. And when you, when you've created this herd mentality, my goodness me, it's been around for a few thousand years now, and you've got people to police each other, what you do then is you break up the herd mentality into warring factions. What you do is you create organizations and belief systems that can be played off against each other, like religions, political parties, economic systems, and all this stuff. And then you get people to fight and war with each other. So now we're not only a herd mentality, the herd mentality is at war with itself. And while we're cussing each other and shouting each other and blaming each other, the few are pulling the strings of all sides. But we don't stop for long enough. We don't have quiet for long enough to say to the people we conflict with, Excuse me, who are they? And why have they got strings attached to me? 
and he's got the same strings attached to you, and I'm opposing you. Because if you are going to hold a position of global control, you have to have conflict and chaos. The 33rd degree level of Freemasonry, I understand, has a, ma a motto, Ordo Ab Chao, Order Out of Chaos. If you can create the chaos, you can offer order out of the chaos you've created, your order, your agenda, what you want the world to be. You try manipulating harmony. You try manipulating people who have respect for another's right to be different. It's a nightmare. You try manipulating conflict, piece of cake. And that's why the world's full of chaos and conflict. It's about control. And this hassle-free zone version of reality is so narrow and so limited that there are no opposites in there. So we have to invent opposites to play off against each other to create the divide and rule. For instance, people who are opposites, I'm told, I read it somewhere, go to war with each other. No, they don't. The opposite of people who see war as an answer to anything are people who see war as an answer to nothing. And they will never fight them because they don't want to know. Opposames go to war to groups who see war as an answer to something. And I'll give you a great example of Opposames. During the last war, World War, the far, 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 far left, as symbolized by Joseph Stalin, was played off against the far, 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 far right, as symbolized by Adolf Hitler. And of course they were very different, we all know that. Teacher told me once. See, Joseph Stalin was into centralized control, military dictatorship and concentration camps. And of course Adolf Hitler, as we know, was into something very different. He was the opposite of that. He was into centralized control, military dictatorship and concentration camps. And these were played off against each other as opposites, and they were just opposames. If someone can tell me a difference between a Muslim religious person imposing his belief on his children at the exclusion of other possibilities and a rabbi imposing his belief on his children to the exclusion of all possibilities and a Christian bishop doing the same, then I'd like to hear it. Opposames. Same state of being, different name on the door, different dress on. And these opposames are being played off all over society to create this divide and rule. And this is why when someone stands up with a different vision of possibility to the norm, they are jumped upon so fiercely because someone with a different vision of possibility shows that the norms are not the only possible reality. And of course to control that has to remain in people's minds as the only possible reality. Well, I don't, this is what it's like, nothing you can do about it. I already come across this, this, um, this film called Bugs Life. It's a kind of animated film like this. It is so profound when you, when you watch it. And there's one clip in it which I'm going to show you, which indicates some of the key methods of how the few control the many. For people who haven't seen it, um, there's this ant colony, symbolic of the human race, at a place called Ant Island. There's millions of these friggin' ants. And then there's a handful of grasshoppers. And the grasshoppers terrify the ants and frighten them and divide and rule them into spending their entire lives all year gathering food, not for themselves, for these grasshoppers who come once a year, take all the food and off they go. One year, one ant stands up to these grasshoppers. 
And the clip you're going to see, these grasshoppers are in their winter quarters, you might call it. They have all the food they need for the winter. And one or two of these grasshoppers start to say, hey, we don't have to go to Ant Island to get all that food. We don't need it. We can stay here. And then the leader tells them the reality of what must happen if the few are going to control the many. And because people say to me sometimes, and I understand it, why do these people who've got more money and more companies and more businesses and more wealth than they could spend in a thousand lifetimes, why did they go on gathering more? It's just greedy. No, at that level it's not about greed, it's about controlling the flow of money and wealth and finance so the people are controlled through that means. And this is the clip. You see, I've been thinking, okay, which is something that I do, you know, being vice president of the office. And this is a thought. It was mine. Why go back to Ant Island at all? I mean, you don't even like grapes. What? You're right. I didn't think it was such a good idea myself. Actually, it wasn't even my idea. It was Axel and Loco. They talk fancy to me. I got confused. <laughs> Guys, order another round because we're staying here. Yeah. What was I thinking going back to Ant Island? I mean, we just got here and we have more than enough food to get us through the winter, right? Why go back? But there was that ant that stood up to me. Yeah, but we can forget about him. Yeah, it was just one ant. Ooh, one ant. <laughs> yeah, you're right. It's just one ant. Yeah, boy, they're puny. Hmm, puny. Say, let's pretend this brain is a puny little ant. Did that hurt? <laughs> nope. Well, how about this one? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> how about this? You let one ant stand up to us, then they all might stand up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? Fight the motivation up. Those puny little ants outnumber us a hundred to one. And if they ever figure that out, there goes our way of life. It's not about food. It's about keeping those ants in line. That's why we're going back. Does anybody else want to stay? He's quite the motivational speaker, isn't he? Let's ride! And in that little clip are so many elements that are used on the human race all the time. But the key is to keep us in ignorance of the true magnitude of who we are and to keep us in ignorance that there is any manipulation on the scale I'm going to reveal tonight going on. So, in the next few hours, we're going to look behind this movie that is projected at us through the media and education and, oh my goodness, day after day, lifetime after lifetime. And will look behind the movie screen and see what's really going on, symbolized by this card I found, where you've got the, um, the peacock symbolically projecting this movie and the lady peacock is saying, cut the crap and show as you're willing. And what we're going to say to this system this evening is cut the crap and show as you're willing. And it's not a pretty sight, I have to tell you. But it's, it's actually worth seeing just out of interest. Well, that's what they tell me anyway. I don't know, I don't know about that. Now, this manipulation 
of the world has not been going on for five years or ten years or ten decades. It's been going on for thousands of years. When I started on this journey of uncovering this, I didn't know there was anything to uncover really when I started. I knew there was manipulation going on, but this big, my goodness. I came to the point, particularly about 1995, when I wrote a book called And the Truth Shall Set You Free, where I kind of established the structure by which the world is controlled today, and we'll get into that in the second part of the evening. Very simple structure, couldn't work if it, if it was complex. may appear complex, but it's dead simple at its core, it has to be. And it, it, it was very clear to me when I'd seen how this works today, that this could not have been created in a short time. It had to have been created over a long period. So I started the journey of going back. The journey of going back to see where this started. And it became obvious very quickly that the institutions of the world today, of politics, of finance, of religion too, and of all these other areas, have not been infiltrated by this network. They were created by them from the start to give the illusion of freedom and choice, the prison without the bars you can see, so that people would go on thinking they were free by what, while being fundamentally controlled. And how that works, we'll get into. And I kept going back, and I got comfortably back to the 11 1200s, the time of the Crusades, and kept going back, and eventually I'm thousands of years BC, before I'm picking up anything like an origin. And what you find in the ancient world is what you find today. This structure. The few hoard very advanced, highly significant knowledge and they pass it on through initiations and other means to only those they wish to have it. At the same time, this group creates institutions and organizations in the public domain, like religions, classic example, that suck this knowledge that still circulates here in various forms out of public circulation. Why was the great library at Alexandria with all that vast esoteric and historical knowledge burned and destroyed? Why was it that when the European uh, peoples under the control of this network, as we'll see, went into Australia, went into Africa, went into South and Central and North America, they destroyed the ancient knowledge. They destroyed the ancient cultures. They destroyed as much as they could of the history held by those peoples because they wanted to suck this knowledge out of circulation and keep the people in ignorance both of what's been going on, therefore what is going on, and also of the true magnitude of who we are and the nature of life itself. So up here in the ancient world were like maps of the world, for instance, which history teachers and professors today say didn't exist, except some of them have been found, which rather gives it away. And up there today is fantastic technology, which if used in a positive way could set this world free of so many unsolvable problems, which are not unsolvable at all, they're manufactured to create the very circumstances in which the few can control the many. About two years ago now, I was asked through a third party in America to meet a guy who joined the CIA as a scientist in his early twenties. He's a genius in the area of magnetics. He joined the CIA, as many people do, and many people who join these organizations thinking he was serving his country, because he's here in this compartmentalized pyramidal system that the world's controlled through. Very soon after he started to work for the CIA, he realized uh, a very clear truth. They didn't want him to serve the country at all. They wanted his knowledge to advance this agenda of global central control 
of the collective and individual minds of humanity. And he started to rebel. And one day, he walked out of his house, and he has missing time after that. And the next thing he remembers is waking up, lying on a medical bench type thing in this room. And as he got his back on his back, he realized there was something stuck to his chest. And he's opening his shirt as he's telling me the story. And on his chest was a see-through plastic sachet looking thing. And inside I could see this yellowy golden liquid. And what they'd done is manipulate his body to need this drug to survive. And if it's not replaced, and it has to be replaced every 72 hours, he starts to die. I met this guy and his children are there, and his wife. He doesn't want to die and leave us. So he still serves the CIA. But he wanted to talk to me to get out what was going on because he couldn't do it. And that's just not one example, one extreme example. Genius all over the world is being imprisoned in this way to serve the agenda I'm talking about tonight rather than using that very same knowledge to set this world free. And he told me that the cure for cancer has been known for decades. He told me that technology that could give us all the warmth and power we need without uh, any more utility bills, free energy technology that accesses the natural um, vibrational fields of the earth and turns it into usable warmth and power has been known for decades. and that the ability to create abundant growth in deserts without water has been known for decades. At its optimum, he says, the plants grow like a time-lapse photograph and it's using magnetics to resonate the energy field of the plant and it, what unfolds physically in front of your eyes is just extraordinary. So why, why is this technology that could bring an end to famine. That could bring an end to hunger. That could be, bring an end to people having to serve the system and do jobs they don't want to do because they have to pay um, gas and electricity bills all the time. Why isn't it here? Because the problems in this world of scarcity are not natural phenomena. I've been to Africa quite a lot in the last few years and anyone that thinks that Africa can't feed itself, well, my goodness me. It's ludicrous. That continent is abundant, or could be. But that abundance is devastated by manufactured, manipulated war, and by Western transnational companies hijacking food growing land for the Western market while empty bellies continue in the very countries where that land exists and that cocoa or whatever is being grown for the Western chocolate industry. Why? Many reasons. Yes, greed to an extent, but it's bigger than that. It's this simple, this simple knowledge of what you must do if you're going to control the many. Abundance equals choice equals freedom. Scarcity equals dependency equals control. So these technologies that could end famine are not introduced because abundance is not the equal of control. Abundance equals freedom. So I started to understand how this works. And like I say, when I started to go back the structure continued right back into the ancient world of people hoarding advanced knowledge in the hands of the few, passing it on through the mystery schools and now into this global secret society network that's exploded as the years have unfolded and keeping the people in ignorance of that knowledge. And when you realize that was going on all that time back, a lot of mysteries start to dissolve. Because that's a great thing, mysteries, you know. If you want to keep people in ignorance, it's great mysteries. Because when you give a version of history and something turns up that can't be explained by your version of history, 
instead of saying, oh, we might have to evolve our version of history in the light of this information. No, oh, if that's true, mate, what about that? Oh, it's a mystery. People, see, people don't, don't care if we discuss mysteries. As long as at the end of the discussion, the mystery is held. The nightmare is the mystery being unraveled. There's a, there's a, a radio show in America. I wonder if anyone's come across it over here. It's called the Art Bell Show. There's about 20, 25 million listeners a, um, a night in America. And of course, it looks at alternative things and mysteries. And people of that mind, um, and, and it's a, a massively growing number daily, focus on the Art Bell Show as these mysteries are being discussed. But at the end of the night, night after night after night, on this Art Bell Show, the mystery remains. What he won't have on his show are people that connect the dots and expose the fact that it's rather less than mysterious. So we're going to try to do that tonight. So, what we're told is that in the ancient world there were a primitive people and that we have evolved from that primitive state to our current cutting edge of human evolution and technological knowledge. I know that's true, because the professors will say it all the time. Uh, we, we, we professors who know at Oxford and Cambridge were very, very clever, you know, very, very, very bright and eagerly. Uh, we, we, we worked in all that, very primitive people in the ancient world. You know. Very primitive, not, not like us, not clever like us. Okay. Who built them buggers then? <laughs> Still question, prof. Very, very primitive people, you'll say, very primitive, very primitive. What they did, you'll say. We've worked it up, we've very, very clever, very clever. What we did, what they did, so they, they built these ramp sure, say. Yes, I know, they had to use as many bricks to build the ramps as the pyramids, but I don't want to talk about that. They built these ramp sure, say. And they built them higher and higher and higher, and they pushed their stones, yes, 270 tons, some of them, yes, quite right, quite right, up the ramps, and they built the pyramid, sure, say. Any great work, eh? You could talk that complete bloody bullshit and get paid for it. I mean, Jesus, I'm going to try that bugger. Thank you, what a great way to earn a living. Um, that great pyramid consists of six and a half million tons of stone. There is enough stone to build 30 Empire State Buildings and a wall around the entire boundary of France. A primitive people did that. I've read it some way, see. And look at this bugger here. All across the ancient world. Now that is 440 tons, that bloody sodded thing is. Now Bill and Fred down the builder's yard have moved that and they... Imagine picking up the phone tomorrow in Froome like or wherever, you know. I know, Bill, I've got a job for you. I've got this 440 ton stone, mate. It's in the garden. What it move in? Next thing you know, the door would knock, and there'd be this guy in this white coat, you see, and there'd be this ambulance with its blue light flashing, you know, next to the gate. I mean, they'd think you were insane. But they did that thousands of years ago. It's a mystery. Now this is also Peru. Now Bill and Fred have hit that bugger with an hammer and chisel, haven't they? I mean, look at it. And all, I've only used to been seeing these documentaries recently that have been coming out the last few years, not exposing what's going on, but looking at these amazing structures all over the bloody planet and how um, the techniques like this can be seen all over the world. It's very clear that at some point in the ancient past there was some kind of highly advanced global society. So. Who were they and where did they come from? And that's the point, you see. Was it George Orwell, in his book 1984, said words to this effect, he who controls history controls the present and he who controls the present controls history. And the writing of history. 
if we know truly where we've come from, we can get a fix on where we are. If you rewrite that, you give people a false fix of where they are. And so, to stop this house of cards, this row of dominoes starting to fall, the line has to be held with their version of history. Because if we thought there were massively advanced people in the ancient world that could do this sort of stuff, then we start asking a few questions. Well, what happened to them? Where did the knowledge go? Where are they now? And the dominoes start to fall. So you have to hold the dam of they were just primitive people. Ludicrous as it is, you daren't let the cracks appear. Otherwise, many things start to happen you don't want to happen. This is Baalbek in the Lebanon. To build this thing, they had to move three chunks of stone, each of which weigh 800 tons, at least a third of a mile. And another chunk of stone at Baalbek weighs a thousand tons, which I understand is three jumbo jets. Very primitive people, you know, very primitive people. <laughs> this is Tony Blair in a previous um, incarnation. <laughs> Actually, some people wish it was, because that weighs ten tons, that bloody act does, you know what I mean? I can't believe Tony Blair. I really can't. I can't believe any of them. Man. But again, it's a mystery, these statues of Easter Island. Mystery, see? No one knows. Oh, he's got constipation, old Tom. Look at him. I mean, he's obviously got a problem there. Like this. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you came. Now, this is Peru, the Nazca Lines. The, they scored away the top surface of the land and with one continuous line created these incredible depictions of birds and animals. This is a, a, a spider. These were only seen, some of them, in their entirety after 1939 when people started flying over them. Because some of them could only be seen in their entirety from a thousand and two thousand feet. It's a, it's a mystery. Mystery? And this next one, if anyone thinks that prophecy is a myth, I can prove them wrong. On a hillside, not too far from here in Dorset, is the living proof that the ancients knew of the future incarnation on planet Earth of Bill Clinton. <laughs> it's a giveaway, isn't it? It's a bloody giveaway. Makes my eyes water. That he, he's obviously a member of the club. Look at him. Look at him there. Actually, I was reading a, reading last year sometime that when Queen Victoria visited this place, you know, they they covered it up. You know, maybe he's never bloody seen one. I don't know. I doubt it myself. So, where did this knowledge come from? This knowledge that we use to build these fantastic ancient structures. Where did the knowledge come from that this network, which we'll call the Illuminati, illuminated into knowledge the masses do not get? Where did this knowledge come from? And I put this on the screen because this is just a fraction of the Milky Way galaxy. Watching one of these Carl Sagan videos, you know this cosmologist chap in America, recently, and he was saying, that light traveling at 186,000 miles a second would take 100 years to pass from one side of this galaxy to the other. Conventional science estimates there are at least one billion of these galaxies and around a billion trillion And yet, it is more credible, it seems, to say that life as we know it only evolved on this one planet in this one solar system than it is to say, just on the law of averages, bit of a chance, what? That life as we know it might have evolved, and as we don't know it too, in other areas of this vast infinity. And yet, you know, when you talk about it, you get people go. He bloody mad he is. He bloody mad. He thinks he's all the life in the universe that's more intelligent than me, you know. 
And you're giving it... I've seen cups of coffee more intelligent than you, darling. We don't have to go off planet for this. Amazing how we, we see it in a, such a topsy-turvy way. So when I started going back, searching for an origin to this global manipulation of today, I started to scan the ancient texts and accounts all over the world, and there was a very clear common theme. That of a race or races, but I'm going to concentrate on one for most of the night, of gods from other worlds who interbred with humanity, creating crossbreed, hybrid bloodlines. In the Bible, not that I quote that very much, but in the Bible, in the Old Testament, in Genesis, it talks about the sons of God who interbred with the daughters of men. And when you go back to what that was translated from, it actually says sons of the gods interbred with the daughters of men, creating the crossbreed hybrid race, the Nephilim, who caused mayhem. And that same theme can be found all over the ancient world of this hybrid race of gods or the offspring of gods. The most famous recently, not famous enough mind, of these accounts have become known as the Sumerian Tablets. In 1850 an English guy called Layard found uh, tens of thousands of clay tablets in what we now call Iraq, which were buried, it is estimated, around 2000 BC. And they tell the story of that area of the world, which we now call Iraq, uh, which, uh, of course, spawned the Summa Society, uh, which even conventional history says was the cradle or a cradle of modern civilization. Well ahead of its uh, time. And of course, not far, just down the road really, was Egypt, which again was a society far ahead of its time. And what's interesting about those two cultures is the normal course of evolution is to start at one level and through trial and error and learning, you evolve to a higher level. Both of those societies started at the peak of their existence and gradually fell away. The opposite of what you would expect. And these Sumerian tablets that increasingly have been translated and books written about the translations talk about how this race of gods, which the tablets call the Anunnaki, which apparently in Sumerian translates as those who from heaven to earth came, not only brought great knowledge to that area of the world, but interbred with humans, creating crossbreed bloodlines, a hybrid race, which the tablets say, and this is highly significant, were put into the positions of ruling